I'll come out now right at the beginning and say that uh, unfortunately I haven't got that many real surprise events and I think that might be typical of quite a tightly managed program and that the events I'm going to talk about are uh, events that occurred during times when we would have expected avalanche activity to occur and really the surprise that I'm going to be talking about is maybe the size, the mechanism or the nature of the situation that caused the surprise. So uh, in my experience while I was on the road, we never had an avalanche that caught us completely by surprise, but we did have several situations where things kind of got a little bit awkward, a little bit tricky, or they went a lot bigger than we'd ever thought they would. So there is still a surprise element there. Uh, this photo I'd like to start with just because um, it reminds me of how different the snow environment is to where we are right now. Uh, that is the Pacific Ocean, uh, just off the side there. And this is our last avalanche path when you're taking the drive to Milford Sound. And it literally, when it goes big, flows into the sea. So, uh, you know, it's pretty different snow climatology to here in Bozeman uh, and here sort of in the central US. Uh, it's also very, very steep country. And a lot of the country, uh, well, pretty much all of the start zones are inaccessible during storm periods. And you pretty much always need a helicopter to get into them. So the type of forecasting, the type of work you do, is very different to what you traditionally do as a ski patroller or as a forecaster, where you get your hands in the snow every day. A lot of it's done from uh, sort of remote products. Here's another shot. This is the eastern side. This is heading towards the ocean. Uh, there is a tunnel that goes underneath this pass here. Uh, and as you can see, very, very U-shaped valleys, very steep. Uh, and just to give you an idea of scale there, um, we're sitting, I'm going to talk in metric, we're sitting at about 900 metres here, we're sitting at about 2200 metres here. So we've got cliffs in the order of anywhere between 800 and 2000 metres of the dirt uh, before it hits the road. So things kind of pick up at a speed uh, and cause a bit of a mess when they go. The flip side to that too is that the scale of your forecasting is different to a ski field operation. Size 2, you're not really too worried about it. It's likely not going to hit the road. So you're looking at some of those bigger events, which then also, I think, makes it harder to be completely surprised by what's going on. We also have a very active spring program. Uh, a lot of our biggest and nastiest avalanches occur in spring. Uh, climax avalanches, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So for today's talk, uh, because I'm a little bit thin on true surprise events, what I really want to do is just provide a little bit of context to the program, so you can kind of see where the program's coming from, what sort of avalanches they're dealing with. Uh, I want to talk about the, the program that's there at the moment, how it was developed, how they manage the avalanche problem, uh, and then I'll finish off with some surprise events, and I've categorised those into uh, four main categories where we have kind of surprise events from the fact that you are remote forecasting, that you are not in the start zones, that you're doing it from telemetry data often, uh, surprise events around the terrain, so you're not, uh, as similar to that, you're not in the terrain, you're often a long, long way below that terrain, and as an avalanche professional, that's not a problem, you know that, but it's a real issue in terms of uh, dealing with your clientele, dealing with your public. If they're sitting in a uh, nice, green, lush, tropical rainforest, it's very hard for them to think that parking their car and having lunch right there isn't a good idea because a thousand metres above them is a big avalanche that's going to cause a lot of mess. So, while as professionals it's not a problem, it's a real issue in terms of perception and how you manage that terrain and how you manage that program. Weather, uh, weather can often cause a surprise in the avalanche forecasting world. I'll give you a quick example of that. And then there's a few other things just to uh, keep people on their toes, such as seismic triggers, uh, which have caused avalanches as well on the road. So that's not enough to uh, deal with them really. Here's just a photo giving you an idea of the sort of type of avalanche we're getting. Um, coming off a nice raised bench. Uh, that's the road, snow covered below. And that's going to drop about seven or 800 metres uh, before it actually touches ground again. So these become fully airborne. Um, and obviously when you're sitting down here, you know, you're trying to forecast for a slope up here, and very seldom do you actually get into those start zones. So it's an interesting position to be in. 
Just very quickly, uh, it's down the southwestern corner of New Zealand. Uh, we are at that stage about three and a half thousand kilometres from the nearest landmass. Antarctica is closer to us than Australia at this stage. So, you know, we, we are kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we also get hit by a lot of westerly flow. We typically get around 8 to 10 to 12 metres of water equivalent per year. Uh, about 70% of that is snow. So it's quite a large volume of snow coming through the mountains. We typically see about 2 metres in a, in a good dump. And as I said, we've got about a thousand, up to two thousand vertical before it hits the road. So you've got some pretty interesting terrain and conditions to be dealing with. That's the next shot in that series. And obviously just reinforcing that idea. You know, you could be down there in this sort of semi-subtropical forest, <laughs> nice and green, smelling the leaves, smelling the soil under your boots while you're needing the mud. Uh, and then this thing could come down on you. So it's a real, it's a real head game. You know, you're driving through green. Everything's good, and then this sort of thing comes down. So this was one that we triggered, uh, and once again, you can see the road there for scale. It's, uh, it's a reasonable sized event. So the Milford Road, um, it was first discovered in 1889, early days of New Zealand history. Uh, in 1934, Parliament, in its wisdom, suggested to put a tunnel through. And that's such steep terrain, you can't build over it. You've really got a tunnel through it, just a small tunnel is put through. Um, they started building very soon, but got stopped due to the war. Uh, in the end, it was a quite a steep, essentially one-way tunnel. If you encounter a bus in there now, you have to back up, up this grade. Um, so they're still looking at putting a second tunnel through to increase the volumes. Uh, in a lot of ways, that would be a very bad idea, because already there's a large amount of traffic coming through that road, and that obviously is the risk. Um, the interesting thing here was that originally it was just considered a summer destination. So, the road was put through, they knew it was avalanche terrain, but it wasn't really a problem because you just went there in summer once all the snow was melted. But, you know, as things carried on, this is just the start zones above. Uh, just a, it's an interesting place to be forecasting because when you do get up there, you're dropped off by helicopter. Uh, we've, we've recently got a hut up there, but it's a sort of environment where you know that, okay, for the road, we're only worried about size two and a half and up. But for my personal safety, this much snow on an icy base, and I'm taking a big ride down the hill. So uh, it does sort of change. It makes you very, very conservative with where you go and what terrain you get onto. Uh, in '62, essentially, there was more and more pressure from the tourism industry, as it often is, to open up this road. And they basically ran out an approach where they said, well, this winter's not too big, let's open up the road. And they didn't really have a formal program. We then had uh, Edna Chappelle come out to New Zealand in '79. And he did some work and basically sort of um, suggested to the powers that be that really there should be a little bit more than this for this road because it is really <laughs> quite dangerous. Maybe, uh, maybe an avalanche program is not a bad idea given the scale of the problem here. Um, and it was, it's the only avalanche road, only significant highway in New Zealand with a major avalanche problem. So it's not like we are here in the US where we've got multiple avalanche programs and a large pool of people. We've typically only got a few people that are working in this program. Uh, a lot of people want to get involved in it. Uh, but it is quite a unique position in New Zealand. Uh, and Ian Owens and Blair Fitzharris mapped and assessed the hazard back in 1980 following Ed Lachapelle's visit. And then through my PhD with Ian, uh, I got very involved and basically remapped that terrain and reanalyzed the hazard for this road. So this was the original atlas, old school style atlas. Uh, in, uh, it's the imperial version of thick inches there, drawing a bunch of uh, paths on there. And then the, the upgraded version was based in a GIS framework where we could link photos of each path to uh, documentation of events for each path, right through to the weather events for each path, uh, link in the snow pits, and then obviously look at it in spatial terms such as three dimensions, and also relate in a relational sense when did these avalanches go and, and what are the precursors to these events? But really just an avalanche atlas. So the program got started uh, in 84, so it took five years after Ed LaChapelle visited. And unfortunately, as is often the case, it was really started following a death. So a main roading overseer, he'd been there for 20 years, was trying to clear the road following a major avalanche cycle. He was trying to let people out of Milford Sound. They'd been stuck in there for seven days. Anyone's been to Milford Sound, 
there's exceptionally little to do in Milford Sound, and I think after seven days they were worried people were going to start eating each other, so uh, they decided they need to open the road. And uh, he went in there and tried to open the road, and unfortunately got caught in a subsequent avalanche and died. And the thing that's really unique, I think, about this road is that maybe in part because it is the only one in New Zealand, it hasn't just been left to go, right, there's an operation, off you go, you do your thing. They've always had some money put aside to have further research going on. So there's always been some new ideas. <coughs> Howard Conway's been very big in that. He's been involved with the program for at least the last 15, if not longer, years. And prior to that, we had some risk assessments done and some further mapping. And in my work through my PhD, got involved with it as well. But what was really nice about it is that it is, you know, this research isn't always operational. Sometimes it's just interesting or nice, but hopefully over time it leads to improvements operationally. And I guess the testament to that is that there hasn't been a loss of life on that road since 1983. Um, however, the risk is going up. This is, a, this is annual average daily traffic volumes. I've actually just taken the winter vol volumes here. Uh, you can see quite a strong increase there. Uh, that's only 2002. I had a look at the numbers last night. We're now over 1,000 uh, winter traffic volume per day. Uh, and that's increasing at quite a steady rate, basically being driven by international tourism. People come to New Zealand, uh, the ones that have lots of money in only five days, they do Auckland, Rotorua, go look at the Hot Pools, Wellington maybe, Queenstown, Milford Sound. You know, it's one of those key destinations where we get a lot of people coming through. But most people experience it this way. They come in by bus from Queenstown. Queenstown's the hub. It's about a 12 hour day by the time you jump on a bus, three and a half hour drive. You then spend most of the day on a boat out of the fjords, go out to the ocean, uh, look at some whales, look at some dolphins, come back in, jump on the bus and go all the way home. You've got lots of money, you fly, but the vast majority of people come in and out by bus. So not only are we seeing an increase in traffic volume, but we're also seeing the distribution of vehicles being heavily skewed towards buses and very few cars. So in terms of risk, it means that your consequences, if you do have an avalanche on the road, is much greater than just wiping out one car with one family. Yes, it's a tragedy. You take out one bus with 50 Japanese tourists, you've made a dent in New Zealand's GDP and tourism growth for years. You know, it's going to make a really big impact. So this, is, this really changed the dynamics of how you manage that program. The other big issue is that the traffic is extremely bimodal. Rather than having those 1,000 vehicles per day, nicely spread out across the entire day and having a low chance of something happening. They all come in in the morning, they all drop their people off, they all go out for a boat cruise and they all come home at the end of the day. So you've got these two super ways of traffic coming one way or the other. It's a little bit like a, um, like a ski field access road. Everyone goes up in the morning and comes back in the afternoon. This typically is also in the afternoons, often when we see the storms come rolling in off the ocean. So you're starting to get into the situation where People are coming from a long way, it's all bus trips, um, your risk is increasing later in the day typically, and your heaviest traffic volumes are coming in. So that's all making a, an interesting position. The other thing we've seen as well as traffic numbers increasing is that we're seeing a growth in especially the tail shoulder season, and that is obviously when we're getting our largest uh, avalanches occurring. This is in the spring events. And uh, Wayne Caron, who any of you have been to the ISSW and heard presentations about Milford Road, Wayne's often the guy uh, mumbling a few words and, and talking about this. And he's been there for 20 years and knows the program very, very well. But he'll always say that the new snow will, will give you a fright. This is the stuff we see in June, July, something that resembles North American snow, relatively light. But this stuff will kill you. And this is stuff that when it's on the road, is typically approaching densities of five to 600 kilograms per meters cubed, so it's really dense, really heavy, uh, and it's just going to destroy everything in the process. Uh, here's just another shot of one coming down on the road. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in August, it's a relatively dry event, but you know, pretty decent sized events coming down. So just to reinforce some of those points I was making before, um, it's really a valley floor forecasting operation. Observed or class one data, your stability factors. Obviously, if there's avalanches on the road, you've got some of those. Uh, you can see those. You're getting very limited snowpack observations. 
We do get into the start zones during good weather, but typically, you know, just before or just after the storm, very little during the storm. And there's a huge array of climate stations, which is really the key forecasting tool for this road. Um, a lot of what we do is what I call direct action forecasting. It's very much driven by weather. We do see weaknesses in the snowpack, but often it's very much weather dominated. So forecasts are very important, or weather stations are very important. Uh, and obviously active control. Uh, a lot of you will have heard about active control. It's pretty much all helicopter based. Uh, we don't use avalanches, we don't use recoilless rifles. Uh, Gazex has been looked at, but the start zones are just too vast. So we tend to do it all by helicopter. And uh, because we're often also working in wet snow, we tend to use a reasonable amount. So uh, often we'll be using uh, 25, 50, 75 kilo bags at a time uh, to try and really get some things to move. Especially late in the season when we're working with wet snow, uh, the experience has shown that bigger is better, uh, mainly because of, uh, I didn't realise this, but maybe it's this attenuation issue within snow. Um, this is totally out of my depth, but uh, we have seen that when we put a 75 kilo charge on a slope, we can nearly always get it to move, uh, where with 25 we may not. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's exciting work, it's fun work, um, but it's also something that uh, when you're flying in a helicopter with half a ton of explosives um, and fuses going off an open door in bad visibility in the mountains, you kind of decide it might not be something you want to do forever. Um, so, some very valuable experiences, but it can also be extremely dangerous. Unfortunately, they haven't had any incidents. There's just a charge, it's a wet snow. Uh, I think this is a 25 kilo charge. Um, that released a nice event coming up there. So, I probably should have taken this out. This is just an example of one of the, uh, one of the bigger events that we had. About 550 cubic metres of snow covered about a mile of highway uh, and was about 300,000 tonnes roughly. So it's quite a quite a decent size event that covered the road. And the issue here is that the road gets covered, uh, it's then closed for three to four to five days while they dig the road out, and the tourism industry is estimated to lose somewhere between six and ten million dollars a day when that road is closed. So there's some pretty uh, strong incentives to A, keep the road open, and B, when it is closed, open it as quickly as possible. I'll just give you a quick run through some of our weather stations. We have a whole bunch of them. Mount Bell is the one that's been there for the longest. It's up on a ridge very close to the main divide. Gives us most of our information. We have another site slightly further away. So we have a bunch of high elevation sites and some low elevation sites down the road. This is East Homer. West Homer, as you can see, this is still well within the avalanche season. Everything's nice and green. Looks like you could be in your shorts and sandals, some days you can be. And yet, a thousand meters above you, you could be developing some really unpleasant weed layers. A couple more Alpine sites cleared out, and uh, we also have some of our similar scales, which I'll talk about in surprise events quickly, but they're really important. This is a, a weighing lysimeter, similar, so we record not only the amount of water percolating out of the bottom of the snowpack, but we're also weighing that total snowpack at the same time. So it's a little bit like a snow pillow and a similar built all in time. And this is really important because not only does it tell you when the water's coming out the bottom, which is great, it's good news, you're happy when that's coming through, but it also tells you when it's not. I.e. it's precipitating down at, uh, at valley level, we know it's raining, yet we know it's, it's, it's raining on the snowpack and yet we're not seeing anything coming out the bottom. It's getting heavier and heavier and it's being loaded. So that's going to be really important for measuring basically the load on that pack. And we've found that it's been really important for seeing or getting the timing of a big event right. Uh, another station we've got is this one called Gates. This is, this is basically our coldest start zone, and it's the last start zone that we see go isothermal. And this is a snow pole that we have in the snow, and these are different, different depths, sorry. And what we can see as we go from left to right is that slowly um, these temperatures are kind of cold at minus one, and then all of a sudden we get an event, maybe a rain event, and they all approach zero, so that snowpack goes isothermal. The depth at which that's going isothermal is giving us information about where our instability may still persist. Finally, we have another tool called the rover. Um, we've got a little creep gauge on there, and this is designed or was hoped to look at rates of creep in the snowpack 
for some of those big wet slabs or glide outlines that we had. And this is just showing uh, millimetres of creep correlated with precipitation events, hourly precip events. And you can see, you know, during some of these events, we get some rain followed by some very sharp increases of creep going on at this site. So I guess the reason I've shown you all of those, this is a map of the road, is just that it's a very, what I would call a heavily instrumented site. We have a number of very good uh, points of data coming in from us, both from road level and up high. I mentioned at the beginning that we get very few snowpack observations. Uh, we had Paul Fern from SLF come out in 2000 and 2001, I think it was, and one of his main comments was that this is a great program, everything's going really well, but you really need to be looking at what's happening during the storm event to the actual snow, rather than just looking at the weather. So as part of that, we managed to get some funding from the government to build this hut. And what would happen is that myself and Frank and whoever else was silly enough to say yes, would get flown up just as the storm was coming in. And we'd get dumped up there with 10 days of food. And uh, hopefully they'd pick us up after 10 days when the storm had stopped. And our job was to go out every single hour or two and measure changes in snowpack stability. So that was the only way that we could get real-time observations of snow. Um, so I spent many a, a week in this little box uh, waiting for, uh, for well, waiting for the weather to clear actually because we were thoroughly sick of it by the end of the shift. Um, just a couple of shots, it's quite comfortable inside. We had a heater, we had power. It was kind of in New Zealand, a lot of our backcountry huts are uh, rather rudimentary, so to have heater and power was pretty uh, surreal. And we also had a, uh, had a gauge that um, told us what wind speeds were doing. And after the first year, we put a rule in place that said we weren't allowed outside if wind speeds were more than 120 kilometres per hour, because uh, we got swept off our feet a few times the first year. <coughs> so that limited when we could get data, uh, but it was just mainly around the health and safety issue. So now we're going to surprise events. Um, that gives you a bit of a, a feeling about the program. It's a valley based program. And I guess in terms of post control release events, during the four seasons that I was there, I didn't witness a single one. Uh, and I would question whether we see any, just mainly given the size and the charges that we're using and the type of instabilities we're dealing with. And what we saw was that slopes were controlled either released immediately or remain intact, and only after significant new loading, we're talking 2 metres of snow, uh, 200 mils of rain, did we see these sorts of things subsequently released, or they stayed intact for the whole season and melted out in situ. So that was, that was my experience. I haven't got the data to back this up, but we didn't see uh, any post-control releases. However, for surprise events, uh, I'm going to just look at these four items now that I'm trying to get out a little bit. So, surprise events. Remote forecasting. So, during storm periods, as I said prior to 2003, there really wasn't any access to the start zones. So, we were doing all of our assessments of what the snowpack was looking like based on pre and post storm activity and all the data we were getting from the weather stations. And anyone who's worked with real time weather station data, it's fantastic, it's really good, but it's not perfect. It's never going to give you the information like it is when you can look outside and see what's going on. There might be wind effects, there might be sensor malfunctions. You know, it's, not, it's never as reliable as being there. There's always a certain level of pressure to keep that road open. Um, as I said, the tourism industry was a pretty vocal lobby. Um, government was always aware of, kind of the importance of tourism to New Zealand. And yet at the same time, they didn't really consider what the impact would be if a bus did get hit full of Japanese tourists. So it was, a, it was an interesting situation. But one particular surprise event that I could think of, I don't have the, uh, the data to look, look at it in detail, but we had one event where we literally just closed the road, and uh, this was before my time, this was in uh, the 80s, and the road was closed, they decided that in fact the storm was going to come in, and the staff was basically just doing a final sweep, and they were coming from the western side out to the eastern side, coming up the tunnel, and while they were in the tunnel, an avalanche came down on the portal, which is a, a small concrete structure that extends out from the tunnel, and uh, that collapsed in completely. So this is the images from the inside of the tunnel looking out to where a reinforced concrete structure uh, had collapsed in on that tunnel. 
and um, Howard Conway twit, did some numbers on this and basically worked out that the impact pressures were around a thousand kilopascals to have uh, destroyed reinforced concrete. So it's a pretty amazing event. So this is one of those events where, you know, I, I would call it as a surprise and in inverted commas in the fact that they'd closed the road, they knew they were getting avalanche activity or that it was about to come and that the, the staff were really just trying to get out there as quickly as possible. However, it probably came a little bit earlier than they had anticipated, and also uh, probably a little bit bigger than anticipated as well. The post-event analyses indicated that fluctuating freezing levels were likely resulted in snow and rain right <coughs> on the snowpack, depending on the elevation. So I mean, it's a pretty simple sort of a situation that's occurred here, but as a result of that, the weighing isometer was installed to provide us information on when it was raining on the snowpack, when the, when the rain was coming out of the bottom of the snowpack, and when the snowpack was holding on to that rain. So this was a situation where, you know, a very lucky escape, those people would have been killed without a doubt, resulted in an improvement in the sense technology to hopefully not have this happen again. Um, I've already cut this really, but it's about a two by two meter area. Uh, it's something that they built in house and it's just an old shower tray uh, with basically a tipping bucket underneath. It wasn't anything flash at all that it works. Um, so when you when you say you um, you know you try to time it for, for the big events, you know, and you're when you're gonna go do heli bombing or when you're gonna control it, you know, and if you're using the, the catching thing or the snow pillow, you know, if you're if it's not catching any water, so you're saying it's loading really heavily, do you try to wait? until it releases some sweet, like you're, you're starting to get water in there, so you um, know like it's melting and then you'll go up in fire, or you... No, I, I, from you, my experience, once the drainage channels have been established, the problem's over, pretty much. So, uh, we've had situations where um, we've had 300 millimeters of rain, liquid liquid rain, come over the snowpack in 24 hours, and everything's just sat there, no problems. No avalanches whatsoever. We've had buses under there, we've had people taking photos, no problems at all. We've had other times where 100 mils of rain in 24 hours will rip the entire place down. We'll have to, you know, we'll close the road, we'll be scared as anything. And the difference is really about the establishment of drainage channels. So what you need in the first rainfall, and this is this is somewhat substantiated by the, by the numbers we've seen, although don't quote me on this, don't, don't go and uh, use this as your forecasting tool, but um, what we've seen is that if you have a, a relatively gradual warm-up where your pack goes nice thermal and then you have a relatively modest amount of rainfall come through on your first rainfall, you have the establishment of drainage channels at a rate that doesn't allow it to get overloaded as long as there's not an obvious weakness in that layer. Once those drainage channels are established, then you can throw as much water as you like at that mountainside and it's not going to come down. The confounding issue and the real issue we have here is understanding exactly where that freezing level is. And we had a numerous events, once again, when we knew that there'd be an avalanche hazard and the road was closed, where it would be raining, we'd see the tipping bucket go, we'd know water's coming through the drainage channels, everyone's happy, no problems, road's open. And then all of a sudden there'd just be a slight cold front embedded in this, in this westerly system. Temperature would drop and we'd start to deposit fresh snow up top. And because it's right and around that sort of zero plus one degrees, we accumulate a metre of snow in you know, half an hour or something or an hour. You know, it just suddenly just piles on. So now you've got an ice thermal snowpack with drainage channels. You've got half a metre or a metre of fresh snow on top, quite wet and heavy, and then it warms up again. And you put rain onto this new bit of snow that has not got drainage channels. Now you've got this extremely heavy load sitting on top of what was a relatively stable pack and then we're back into the problems. So keeping a really close eye on those temperatures at high elevation was really key to working out the phase of that precipitation. Um, here's just a, a nice, this is some of the work by Howard Conway. And this is a uh, situation where, you know, some of the drainage channels are quite well established. So here we're seeing peak arc flow, 14 and a half millimetres an hour, lagged only by an hour. So this is being recorded down at the bottom we're getting outflow coming out, and it's all just basically just flowing through that snowpack. And as a forecast, you'd be happy at this stage. You're going, ah, we're all good. But you are watching your temperatures to see whether it's not turning back into solid precip. So the key thing, as I already alluded to, is you've really got to know your freezing levels. And that's a, a nice shot there. 
showing essentially where uh, that freezing level was, where we had rain basically pull stuff out, and above that we just had a little bit of wet activity. Um, that's really that, that, that pinpoint of that freezing level. So having a few different stations at different elevations is extremely critical to eliminating that surprise as to is it liquid or is it solid and how is that loading in the start zones. There's another shot coming down east home of this is the tunnel is directly below. This is why they have the portal because uh, the end of the tunnel is in the large avalanche zone. Um, and the other one I'll talk about now is terrain. So I've kind of commented on it already, but we often had very limited access to the start zones, so we used, and, and also limited visibility of some of those start zones. When you're down in the valley floor driving up the road in the morning, you're sitting in your car, actually I've got a, an interesting story there, we, uh, we needed a new vehicle, and uh, so we went to, to management and said, look, we need a new vehicle, and we need it to be a, you know, a pickup truck, uh, but we need this model with the leather seats and the sunroof. And they thought we were taking the piss because, you know, sure, you guys don't need leather, leather seats and a sunroof. But we needed the sunroof because sometimes that's the only way to see the avalanche. It's literally straight up, straight up through the roof. Anyway, management said, no, that's $10,000 more. You can't have it. So they bought us the cheap model. Ended up having to get a sunroof retrofitted, which then leaked pretty much every single day when it rained. They then had to repair that, send it back, and it ended up costing about $15,000 to get it working. Um, and the seats rotted away because you're in such a wet environment that you're coming in and out, the fabric just rots. So uh, the vehicle was trashed within about two years, and the next time they bought us the leather one with, uh, with the sunroof. So uh, if anyone's in management, there's sometimes reasons that we ask these questions. But anyway, sunroof is extremely important for, uh, for seeing some of these events. Um, as I said, the, the avalanches are quite a long way above the road. We have very strong winds, heavy snowfall, and really intense storms. And the difference between where you are in the valley and what it's like at Ridgetop is, is just completely the worlds apart. And we have that everywhere. You know, if you're sitting uh, down at the bottom of Big Sky versus being on top of Big Sky, it's a huge difference in terms of what you might experience in weather. But this is then, in your mind, it's even further apart because you're in a green valley. So that's a, it's a really interesting head space that you can get around. Uh, and that's why I say you need a sort of a, a shift in mindset, but also a little bit of skill set. And that typically the Milford Road Avalanche Program didn't employ people from a ski patrolling background because they were used to having their, their hands in the snow every day. And people that worked well in the program were people that didn't necessarily have to have their hands in the snow every day. Just a few shots to uh, illustrate terrain. That's the End of the tunnel there, that's the portal structure before it got destroyed. And that once again just gives you some, some idea of scale there uh, that you're trying to deal with. This is a, uh, a photo that we took. Uh, I was with, with Wayne on this day. We knew it was a bit, of a, uh, a bit of an unstable day. And we went in for a bit of a look and tried to just be as careful as we could. And we just tucked out of the, the western tunnel and we're sitting outside. And Wayne doesn't like to get out of his truck too much. So he was sitting in the truck, just, just pulled it out, and he got out of the car, he was taking this photo, looking around, and this thing came down, we heard it, he looked up and he got the photo, and at this stage I ran, ran back up the tunnel, Wayne stayed to take another photo, bless him, fantastic <laughs> shot, and I was already about 100 metres up the tunnel by this stage, and, uh, and that's Wayne having just left the truck, door still open, getting pummeled by that avalanche just on the entrance of the tunnel. So, you know, we, it's just such extreme terrain. Things just come down so quickly uh, that, you know, seeing those photos is pretty special. <laughs> There's, I've shown you those as well. Once again, you know, right down into the green as well. And just really to reinforce that issue of scale, this is looking down the western side, uh, just a, a relatively uh, light, dry snow avalanche for Milford. But there's a bus there in that little turnaround. Just to give you a better scale once again. So, you know, when things go wrong, or well, they go big, they go really big down the road. All right, so just finally, um, the weather forecast is the other area where we had some surprise events. And we had a sub hourly, mesoscale data assimilating forecast provided by the local weather operator. So, all of our stations feed back into their model. They were data assimilating, they would update the states, and they would have a pretty good understanding about what current conditions were like to then base their forecasting model off. 
despite that, um, quite often we still see that things came in quite a lot colder or quite a lot sooner. And this is a real issue in terms of when you close that road and when you get everybody out of Milford. If, if the forecast says, right, the storm's going to come in at 7 o'clock tonight, you're like, no problems, we'll close the road by 5, we'll let the bus operators know as they come up the road, roads close at 5, make sure everyone brings their cruisers back early, get everyone back home to Queenstown, everyone's happy. You do it wrong, you've left maybe two, three, four thousand people in, in Milford, and there's really only about 600 beds. So, you know, depending on your inclinations, that's maybe not a bad thing, uh, but most people don't like being caught up as four people to a bed. So, um, um, so what we try and do is really time that with the forecast, and we try not to get that too wrong. And what we can see is when that forecast either came in too cold or came in too soon, is that you need to put chains on the vehicles. Now, uh, living in Montana, you, you probably know about chains, but you don't need to use them. In New Zealand, everyone's got hockey pucks for tyres, and no one has snow tyres, no one knows how to drive in the snow, uh, and it's just carnage the moment there's even a centimetre of snow on the road. It's also very wet, so it is very slippery, it is a different type of snow than here. So the moment you get even that much snow on the ground, chains on 